Look, I'm as big a fan of sword fighting as the next guy, but even in the medieval period, I'd guess a halfway decent archer parked on a hill with a longbow would make any attempt at sword fighting futile. Call it the arrow's impossibility theorem. In less than a month, a few million people in a half dozen states will select who should have the levers of power in the U.S. for the next four years. I've complained about the especially nonsensical structure of the U.S. electoral system in the past, but many game theorists and economists find themselves perplexed by the very notion of voting in an election. They usually aren't decided by less than a few thousand votes, so the odds that your vote will be the one that determines the outcome is tiny, even tinier if you don't live in a swing state. Compared to all the other surefire benefits you might obtain with that time, like cleaning the kitchen or reading a book, it would seem like the expected return on investment of voting is outweighed by just about anything. So why does anyone show up to the polls? This question has been so perplexing to decision theorists that it's become known as the paradox of voting, grouped alongside a number of other confounding findings, like the prisoner's dilemma, in which most prisoners don't seem to rat each other out for perks or the ultimatum game, in which most people would rather tell someone to go to hell than cooperate with them for a tiny share of some reward. We've covered a fair number of these game theory paradoxes on Thunk because they're neat little logic puzzles. It's easy to describe the theory and how people don't behave the way it predicts they ought to, and it can be fun to reason your way through potential fixes, bolting on epicycles that can keep the theory lurching along when it seems to have broken down. Unfortunately, Although game theoretic thinking is very easy to understand and deploy in all sorts of different situations, it's so abstract that there's no surefire way to tell when you're gaining valuable insights by using it and when you're trying to stuff a square peg into a round hole. Economist and philosopher Amartya Sen confronts these issues of theory and practice in his collection of essays titled Rationality and Freedom, an investigation into what it means to be rational in an economic or game theoretic sense what it means to be free, and how the two mutually define and clarify each other. As we discussed in the last episode, the term rationality is often meant in a couple different ways. In the ancient Greek sense, it's a sacred faculty that allows us to transcend our animalistic instincts and live virtuously in societies together, while in the more modern instrumental sense, it's more of a neutral rubric of non-contradiction, of making internally consistent choices. As an economist and decision theorist, you might expect Sen to be a big fan of instrumental rationality, but he doesn't just think it's a flawed standard, but incoherent on its own. That the entire notion of determining whether someone's choices are internally consistent falls apart under scrutiny. To see what he's on about, let's look at another one of those common real-life situations that seems to violate internal consistency. The last appetizer. Say you're at dinner with some friends, and you're all staring at the last mozzarella stick on the plate you might reasonably decide you'd prefer not to take it for yourself. Of course, if there were two left, you would happily grab one without thinking about it. And game theorists would start pulling their hair out. You'd prefer having a mozzarella stick to not having one, but you'd also prefer not having a mozzarella stick to having one? You're clearly insane. Sen thinks that because the typical game theorist's approach to rationality demands that we distill your decisions down to a ranked list of options, a schedule of preferences that puts take a mozzarella stick either above or below don't take a mozzarella stick. The theory has to throw up its hands and declare you irrational. Contrary to this framing, he suggests that what the rubric of rationality actually demands is a critical interrogation of the relationship between a person's choices and their values, the nuanced and multifaceted motivators of human behavior. Wanting the second to last but not the last appetizer isn't irrational if someone can offer coherent reasons for choosing as they do, articulating what drives them to do this or that, whether it's not wanting to be rude or making sure everyone else at the table gets enough before polishing them off or any number of things. There's always the possibility of contradictory or poorly executed values, of failing to resolve conflicting priorities or of acting in a way that you wouldn't have chosen to act if you thought things through a little more. But Sen believes that you can only really make the call that someone's being rational or irrational by engaging with what they care about and why, which is external to the consistency of their choices. This position also puts him in odds with other economists when it comes to the paradigm of rational self-interest. Many economic theories try to simplify the complexity of human motivation by restricting their scope of analysis to individuals and how their choices would affect their welfare, like 
how many dollars they would gain or lose, or how many days they'd have to spend in jail. This can be an effective way to understand what options a perfectly selfish actor would pursue, which can be helpful. But as we've noted, it reliably diverges from what humans actually choose to do in many cases. For Sen, rational self-interest can dictate any number of responses to a situation, depending on how broad of a net we're willing to cast for self-interest. Maximizing my individual welfare certainly makes sense, but so does maximizing my people's welfare or achieving my goals, which might prescribe totally different choices. If we accept the full scope of anything our rational actor might care about, including the authority to choose regardless of outcome, the process by which one's choice will be enacted, morality, norms, or even preferences about what sort of preferences one might like to hold in the future, there are a number of possibilities that can explode the complexity of any decision in ways that can't be reduced to a simple ranking of choices. That isn't to say game theoretic analysis can't be useful, but when we're trying to map out an individual's preferences, Sen argues that we can't artificially restrict the domain of those preferences to some narrow sense of self-interest and expect to glean deep insights about human behavior. If you play some version of The Prisoner's Dilemma and arbitrarily decide that years in prison are the only things the players can care about, you're going to be repeatedly baffled by their behavior. All this is to say, our conception of rationality is contingent on what freedom we allow in that framework for individuals to value what they actually value. Sen's broader notion of rationality dissolves the paradox of voting instantly. People don't just vote in presidential elections because they want to be the one who decides who gets to be president. People vote for all sorts of reasons. Because they want to signal their support for a platform. Because they value the act of participation in democracy. Because they don't want to regret not voting in a pivotal election. Because they feel a little warm glow from performing their civic duty. Because they don't want to feel left out when their friends are posting voting day pictures on Instagram. Yes, even the little I voted sticker can play a part in a rational preference for voting over not voting. This open-endedness works the other way too. People who don't have the spare time to stand in line for an hour, who would need to jump through a large number of bureaucratic hoops, who don't see a candidate that represents them and their interests, or who might get intimidated or harassed at their polling place, can rationally decide that voting isn't worth it, as at least one third of the country routinely does. This hints at one of Sen's complementary ideas. Not only does our understanding of rationality depend on freedom, our understanding of freedom depends on rationality. The concept of freedom looms large in the United States, but it's a notoriously sticky thing to define. Sen suggests that we can get a better handle on it by thinking of it as a combination of two independent irreducible aspects, process and opportunity. There is a procedural equivalence between myself and Elon Musk vis-a-vis -vis purchasing Twitter, as we are both technically free to leverage our immense wealth and financial resources to buy it. But there is a discrepancy of opportunity to do so, one of many meaningful differences in our capacities to live our lives as we would like to live them, and what options are genuinely available for us to choose from. Any reasonable appraisal of our respective freedom needs to take all of that into account, as a choice that you never have the chance to exercise is no choice at all. Of course, Choices nobody would conceivably ask for are also pretty irrelevant. A constitutional amendment explicitly protecting your right to pound your thumb with a hammer wouldn't really expand your freedom in any meaningful sense. If we're interested in maximizing the real freedom members of our society enjoy, we have to evaluate and compare people's rational preferences in the broad way that Sen has characterized. Not just the best option for everyone's narrow self-interest, which we've seen can be overly restrictive, not every single thing allowed by the laws of physics, which is uninformative, but the genuine capacity for people to do whatever they might have reason to value doing. With respect to voting, having the procedural right to vote is obviously important. It's pretty hard to cast a ballot if you're legally forbidden from doing so. But that procedural freedom alone is insufficient to determine if someone is really free to vote. It's certainly possible that they might weigh their options and decide, even if it would be trivial, voting still isn't worth the effort. But evaluating whether they have sufficient opportunity requires putting ourselves in their shoes and thinking through their legitimate options. Rolling the dice on making rent so that you can take the day off work and stand in line at the polls isn't a thing most people would consider a rational thing to entertain. So it's hard to argue that being confronted with that choice, they are really free to choose either way. 
This coupling of freedom and rationality clarifies some of the demands of the rational society we all hope to belong to someday. It also poses a challenge. In order to make justified decisions about how we should structure that society, it compels us to imagine ourselves in the shoes of the people we live in society with, to ask how we would go about things if we shared their values, what formal allowances are made to pursue those options, what genuine opportunity they have to make use of those allowances, and the likely consequences of their choices. All that requires discussion, debate, empathy, and comparison of outcomes, with an eye towards who is getting their way and how much. In a way, Sen's approach may have dissolved the paradox of voting, but it also reveals that merely voting is insufficient to build our society in a rational way. Regardless of what happens in November, the hard work of figuring out what sort of freedom the people of the US want and how we can rationally go about creating it will still be waiting for us on the other side, even if someone decides to ignore the voting results again. Do you agree with Sen's broader conception of rationality as anything that can stand to reasoned reflection? Do you find that his notion of freedom encompassing aspects of both process and opportunity squares with what it means to be free? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah, blah, subscribe, blah, share, and don't stop thunking.